In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. Earlier this year, I was preaching in Tennessee and met a family vacationing there from Texas. Actually, there were former Tennesseans returned for a visit. The lady told me of their migration to Texas about the time of the Civil War. It seems that her grandfather sold uh, the family plantation there in Tennessee and took his family to Texas. But much to his surprise, after the war, when he was ready to buy a farm, the large sum of Confederate money he had received for the plantation was worthless, and they had to start all over from scratch. It reminded me of uh, what happened some in uh, some of the Soviet states after the collapse of that union. In an effort to control inflation, the old rubles were voided and replaced with new money. Newspapers used such words as panic and anger to describe the public response, and you can see why. Suppose it were to happen in America. If our government were to suddenly announce that we're changing currency and the dollar is no longer of any value. It's worthless, as a matter of fact. Well, I suspect we'd be using stronger language than those words. Well, in all the excitement over change, the reality is there are some things we just don't want anybody changing up. Every one of us seeks permanence in some things. And you know what? It's the thing we value most in which we want permanence. It's in the constant, immutable, enduring, and stable things that we find the security we need, all of us, and that that we want so badly. And where else is that more true than our religious faith? The new here today, gone tomorrow faith, our church, in spite of all of its hype about freedom of expression and its dazzling flamboyant showiness, just doesn't seem to well, it just isn't there to sustain us when we need some strong, immovable undergirding. Welcome, my friend, to our program of Bible study in search of the Lord's way. I'm glad you've joined us. We're giving today's message the title, The Spirit of True Worship. 
Worship is a very vital part of any religion, but the most definitive statement that has ever been made by any religious leader was made by Jesus Christ Himself in His conversation with the woman at uh, Jacob's well in Samaria. And I'm going to read from John chapter 4, beginning at verse 19. And the woman said to Him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, and now, uh, and the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem uh, worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And I read through verse 24. Now let us go to our Father in prayer. Our God and our Father, we bow before You with praise and thanksgiving for the multitude of blessings we receive from You that are both spiritual in their nature and sometimes material. We know that all good gifts come from Thee, and we give You our praise and our thanks. Father, we're thankful for the privilege of being together on occasions like this to study how we may worship Thee with a better spirit and in truth. We'd ask Your blessings on our study today, all who join us, in Jesus' name, amen. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, the calls me from the world of care, and bids me at my Father's throne, make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief. And all this faith that enters there by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear. Worship is a universal exercise of the human family. Unlike all the other creatures, man is a worshiping being. Wherever and whenever we've been found living on the earth, from as far back as we can trace our existence, worship has been an important part of our lives. It's been said that in the beginning God made man in His image, and ever since man has been making gods in His image. So, with all the pluralism of our present-day religious thought, the Bible believer cannot argue that all our worship has always been of or to the living and true God. Nor can we say that all the ways of man's worship to Jehovah have been to His glory and praise. When the Apostle Paul arrived in the great city of Athens, for example, he found a city that was wholly given to idolatry, Acts 17, verse 16. And there were more gods, it was said, in Athens than there were men. Paul's heart was stirred in him so that he immediately rose up and began preaching Jesus Christ, first to the Jews in the synagogues, then to the Greeks in the marketplace. And those who wanted to know more summoned him to Mars Hill. That's the hill of Mars, their god of war. There, and I mean he was literally surrounded by the magnificent temples erected to their gods, Paul didn't argue the case for toleration and acceptance of all of these gods made with their hands. Rather, he taught them about the God who made the world and all things therein. Well, this was characteristic of the Christians of the first century. They were not very pluralistic. 
Thus the Scripture says that many turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Well, we can learn from them that God, the God that we worship, is important. Nor from our survey of the history of worship could we argue that all worship rendered to Jehovah has glorified and honored Him at all times. From Paul's Athenian experience, we can also learn that the manner of worship is important. Paul told them that the way some of them sought to praise God, who was to them the unknown God, was not acceptable. It wasn't a matter of sincerity, but of knowing. They just didn't know how to worship God acceptably. During his earthly ministry, Jesus found some of the Jews even worshiping Jehovah in vain. They came to him asking him, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? Please notice that it was not a question of transgressing the teachings of God, but the traditions of the elders. So Jesus retorted, Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? And he quoted them an appropriate scripture from Isaiah. Is chapter 29, verse 13, we know now. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, The people draws nigh unto me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That's all found in Matthew 15, verses 1 to 9. And from it, we learn that a person worshiping Jehovah can render his worship vain or empty or hollow, meaningless and unavailing, simply by teaching the doctrines and the traditions of mere men. In the passage we read a moment ago at the beginning, Jesus spoke, uh, spoke of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. This is true worship as contrasted to what's vain worship. Such worship is a vital part of the Christian's faith and life. Our Lord taught us to make a place for it in our daily routine for private worship of God when He said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, When you pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut the door, Pray to your Father which sees in secret, and your Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. The early Christians also had assemblies in which they came together for worship and for mutual edification. Acts chapter 5 verse 42 says, And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. There were occasions, too, when they came together as the church just for prayer. One such occasion is recorded for us in the book of Acts, the 12th chapter. Peter was miraculously re released from prison that night, and he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And then from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, it's obvious that the church came together upon the first day of the week to observe the Lord's Supper. Paul preached to them in that assembly, and there's no doubt that they sang and that they prayed. But the purpose for the meeting well, on that first day of the week had already been established as a custom. It was for the observance of the Lord's Supper. While the worship assemblies were not the purpose for which Jesus Christ built His church, they were very vital to its strength and its well-being. So important were they that when, because of severe persecution, they became extremely difficult, the Holy Spirit said, Let us consider one another to provoke to love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What they did in their assemblies 
and the spirit in which their worship was rendered were important too. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, prescribes the proper order in an assembly of the church wherein those with the gift of prophecy received and relayed to the disciples messages from God. James, the Lord's brother, also speaks of the kind of spirit that should characterize their assemblies. In his epistle, chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, he said, If there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that wears the gay clothing, and you say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place. And you say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit there under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? So, Christian assemblies for worship are a part of the life of the church, and not to be forsaken. They're not merely the traditions of men. People who perceive them so must either be unaware of those scriptures that we've just studied and others, or they just simply ignore them, one or the other. Others would like to replace the biblical meeting with another kind. Over the centuries, there's been a tendency of humankind to change the order of worship from that described in the New Testament churches by the introduction of some of the cultural, those things of cultural value in the civilizations into which the church has gone. Many of those innovations were completely without biblical authority, having only the authority of, the, of a council somewhere, or a conference, or a synod of men. And these changes were never accepted without great controversy which sometimes even resulted in divisions in Christendom, contrary to the teachings and the will of Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Like the Jews whom we mentioned a while ago, churches have transgressed the commandments of God by holding to those traditions. And, like those Jews, they have rendered worship in those circumstances vain, meaningless, a cold ritual performance or ceremony or liturgy, irrelevant to many worshipers and totally irrelevant to the meaning of life. Some, in a justifiable rejection of this vain formalism, while advocating free expression of a personal religion, may unknowingly and unwittingly be turning to what the Holy Spirit calls will worship in Colossians chapter 2, verse 23. From all I can learn from scholars about this passage, it simply refers to a self-centered performance or worship that focuses on the worshiper instead of God. In fact, it makes the worshiper the worshipped. It's the worship of self. It's been described by some as getting high or getting on a spiritual high. Accordingly, many places of worship have just degenerated into nothing more than mere entertainment or amusement. And the real need of the soul for worship remains unmet. Well, perhaps it's time for a restatement of what worship is all about. Perhaps we need to define worship for the sake of those who don't understand what it is. The New Testament word most often translated worship means literally to kiss the hand of or to bow down to or before or falling down before that's the word for worship. And the true spirit of worship bears no connotation at all to a big show, lots of excitement or celebration. 
There's a time for celebration and excitement and shouting and all of that. But it isn't in worship to produce an emotional high. To worship God is to bow down to God in reverence, in submission. There's no possible way to define it as seeking some kind of a new high experience. And people who are looking for that sort of thing in worshiping assemblies of the church and churches who are trying to produce it have a serious problem with worship. It isn't worship at all they're seeking or providing as the case may be. Characteristic of the me generation, it's focused on the wrong person. In true worship, the worshiper loses himself in his reverence for God and in his submission to God. It's what pleases God that builds up the worshiper. It's a C.S. Lewis, the noted atheist turned believer, has said, nothing should be done or sung or said in church which does not aim directly or indirectly at glorifying God or edifying the people or both. And he went on to say that a good worship period may have some cultural value, but that isn't what worship is for. In keeping with this definition, worship is always and necessarily directed toward God and must never be used as a commercial or promotional to attract people to a given church. That's prostitution of one of the most sacred moments in the life of the Christian and the church, which has degenerated into competition among churches to put on the best show. And of course, the show must get better every week or the crowd doesn't get anything out of it. And it goes where it can get something better. The end results are numbers along with their monetary gifts have become the object of worship and unbelievers and the unconverted define the spirit and the order of Christian worship instead of God. If that spirit of true worship honestly demands that we redefine it, the alternative to the cold formalism of worship enshrouded in human tradition on the one hand and the entertaining innovations of self-pacification and self-worship on the other is worship in spirit and truth of the New Testament. The hungering soul searching for an appropriate expression of his devotion to God will find it in submitting to the will of God as it's revealed in the inspired scriptures. To preserve the spirit of true worship, churches must never authorize what is not authorized in the worship of the New Testament church. Neither should they forbid the practice of anything that has the authority of God's Word. Dear Father, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you, and we pray that as we study these things, we can render worship that is acceptable with you and edifying to each of us. In the lovely name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I will sing the wondrous story My friend, I'm so very glad you were with us for our study today. 
on the spirit of true worship. I pray you've been blessed and that we've provoked you to further study on this matter. We're presented here by Churches of Christ who are trying the very best we know how to worship God in spirit and in truth, just as Jesus taught. If you're interested in doing the same thing, why not worship with us real soon? If you don't know the location of a Church of Christ in your area who worships that way, or if you need to know the time of their worship, call us. I'll be giving you a toll-free number in just a moment so that you can make that call if you like. We in Churches of Christ are trying to reproduce the worship of the first century church in our assemblies today. If you'd like an audio uh, cassette tape or a printed copy of today's program that's titled, The Spirit of True Worship, simply write us and request it by name. Our address is In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. Please tell us whether you want the cassette tape or the printed copy. And would you also tell us on what station or network you've received the program? Now, you don't need to send money. It's free. I mean it. Our program and all we do for people is free, a gift of your neighbors, friends, associates of yours who are members of Churches of Christ because we care. If you prefer to call in your, present, uh, your request for a copy of the program or uh, for the address of a church in your area or for any other reason, you may use our toll-free telephone number, 1-800-321-8633. We'd like to hear from you this week, and we plan to be back here next week with another Bible lesson, and we'd like so very much to have you with us again. Maybe you have other friends relatives, somebody that you'd like to hear these programs too. Tell them about it. Hope to see you next week then. Until then, be assured, we love you. God bless you.